everybody. Hello, the program we have for you today is a deep dive into history, and you're going to be hearing about it in a way that you probably did not hear about it in school. Uh, I say that not because I know about the presentation, but I know about the person and I know two earlier presentations that he made to us, part one and part two, and today you're going to hear part three. So I'm turning the program over now with delight to Howard Moreland. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right, we're going to truck cover uh, 18 centuries in uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> so hang on. Two centuries of crusading in the Middle East ended in failure. Muslims recaptured all the territory held by the Crusader states. In Spain and Portugal, things were different. Everything else was different as well. We should probably start with the third century BCE, when I, the Iberian Peninsula was a patchwork of ethnic and language groups. The first empire to own Spain was Carthage, which was vying with Rome for control of the Mediterranean. Carthage would seem to be the stronger. Carthage was the world's largest city. It had a huge harbor for merchant ships connected to heavily fortified circular naval, naval base with berth, covered berths for 200 birem ore powered warships. At the top of the hill was the center of the empire surrounded by walls. Fun fact, this is what Carthage Harbor looks like today. After losing his first war with Rome, Carthage set out in 218 BCE to eliminate its Roman rival, launching an attack overland from its base in Spain. <clears throat> Hannibal Barca led the army of Carthage around the Pyrenees Mountains and over the Alps to attack Rome from the north. He's sometimes ridiculed for taking war elephants with him as he crossed the Alps. But he actually arrived in good enough shape to conquer the whole of Italy except for Rome itself. On August 2, 216 BCE, he destroyed the much larger Roman army in the Battle of Cannae. Hannibal used a fake retreat to lure Romans into a trap and crush them from the sides. William the Conqueror used the same tactic at the Battle of Hastings in England. The entire Roman army, some 50,000 soldiers, was slaughtered in a single day. The Roman Empire almost died before it was born. But Rome survived and 70 years later in 146 BCE, destroyed Carthage, killed or enslaved its entire population, took over all of its property. That's how Spain switched from being a Carthaginian colony to a Roman colony. The Roman occupation of Spain lasted 700 years. At the height of the Roman Empire, a new religion emerged in the East based on the ministry of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, its empathy, emphasis on empathy, healing the sick, feeling the, feeding the poor, etc stood in direct contrast to the militarism of Roman civilization. It was thus seen as a direct threat to Roman cultural values and Jesus was executed by crucifixion. When that didn't stop his movement, Rome tried using the mass murder of his followers as a halftime show during the gladiatorial games. Speaking of which, gladiatorial entertainment, the defining feature of Roman civilization, served as moral instructions in the virtue of schadenfreude, joy in the suffering of others, and a corrective to the moral weakness of empathy. I'm going out on a limb here to suggest the reason Christianity took the Roman Empire by storm had nothing to do with his birth, death, or degree of divinity. It was his message, an alternative to Roman brutality. His message was like that of the Buddha from four centuries earlier and 4,000 miles to the east, 3,000 miles. Both men preached about human behavior, namely, don't be a jerk. Jesus was the law, great lawgiver of Western civilization, but he didn't promulgate rules. He condensed his message into two commandments, love God, humility, you are not God, and love your neighbor, empathy, the golden rule. He set an example by healing the sick and feeding the poor. 
He told Peter to put away his sword. His ministry was a refutation of Roman domination and cruelty. Before Emperor Constantine adopted Christianity, he convened the first Council of Nicaea in 325 to produce a doctrine, the Nicene Creed, compatible with Roman brutality. To deflect attention from Jesus' ministry, the Nicene Creed focused only on his birth and death. The Nicene Trinity doctrine said Jesus was God in disguise, come to earth to sacrifice himself. This idea is not biblical. The Hebrew scripture Old Testament is quite clear about there being only one God who, by the way, disapproves of human sacrifice. The New Testament written in Greek, not Hebrew, advances the idea that God fathered Jesus by getting a Jewish woman pregnant. This would make Jesus a demigod in the Greek tradition. The Greek pantheon had dozens of demigods, mortals with one divine parent. Eight of the more famous Greek demigods are shown here. Notice Hercules on the upper right. But Constantine needed Jesus to be more than a demigod. He needed Jesus to be God himself. It was the only way to get Rome off the hook for killing the founder of this new religion. A slow agonizing death, crucifixion was also a dramatic public humiliation. That Rome did this to Jesus was awkward to say the least unless Jesus was God doing it to himself. The Nicene Creed asserted that Jesus and the Father were co-eternal, the same age. It warned those who say there was a time when he, Jesus, was not, and the Son of God is created, they are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Two of the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism and later Islam, regarded the Nicene Trinity as a regression into polytheism, but there were plenty of Christians at the time who weren't buying it either. Rome declared them all to be heretics. Chief among them and the greatest threat to Rome were the Arians, so-called after the leader Arius of Alexandria. Arians took the gospel stories at face value, namely that Jesus was the son of God in the Greek demigod tradition. Since this doctrine negated the Trinitarian excuse for the crucifixion, the Arians had to be suppressed. The question how divine was Jesus would dominate the development of Western civilization, never more so than in Spain where the Goths played a key role. Before the Nicene Trinity doctrine, the Goths, a Germanic tribe on the border of the empire, had been recruited to the Roman army and converted to Arian Christianity. <laughs> Soon afterwards, in a dress rehearsal for the 13th century Mongol invasion, Attila the Hun arrived from Central Asia with his army. The Goths chose to move west and fight the Romans rather than stay and fight the Huns. The Western Goths, the Visigoths, moved in first. In 410, the Visigoths famously conquered and sacked the eternal city itself, Rome. They then moved on and settled in southern France and Spain. Remember, these barbarians were actually Christians of the Aryan persuasion, heretics, not pagans. This 19th century painting shows the Visigoths naked as they pull down a statue in Rome. Apparently barbarians don't wear clothes. It is more likely they were dressed like Roman soldiers. By the mid fifth century, Western Roman empire was dominated by Aryan barbarian Christian heretics, i.e. Unitarians. In 455, Rome was sacked again, this time by vandals from North Africa, but help was on the way. Up north, the Aryan Franks were at war with the pagan Alemanni. Things were looking bad for the Franks <clears throat> until Clovis I, their leader, decided to call on his wife's Trinitarian God. His prayer was answered when the Franks won the Battle of Tolbiac in 496. Grateful for the victory, it nonetheless took Clovis 12 years to decide to be baptized as a Catholic. For bringing Northern Europe into the Pope's realm, Clovis's queen Clotilde was given sainthood and later a 19th century church in Paris. Meanwhile, the Aryan Visigoths with their one person God controlled Spain and the South of France from their capital in Toulouse, but they were no match for the Franks under Clovis who were bolstered by the Pope's three-person God. 
By 508, about the time Clovis got baptized, the Franks had driven the Visigoths out of France and established the Merovingian kingdom, which would last two centuries until Charlemagne's grandfather took it over. So things were looking up for the Pope, but there would be one more sacking of Rome by Arians, this time by the Ostrogoths in 456. Imperial Rome would finally go down for the count. It remains in ruins to this day, but the Pope across the river in the Vatican survived. The best news for the Pope came in January 587 when Spain's Arian King Recarid of the Visigoths converted to Trinitarian Roman Catholicism. And that's how Spain became Catholic, but not everybody was happy with the change. The Arians didn't believe in the Trinity, didn't like the Pope, and didn't want to be part of the Roman Catholic world. This was especially true in Septimania, the strip of Mediterranean coast north of the Pyrenees. Neither the Franks nor the Visigoths were able to force Catholicism onto those people until the 13th century Albigensian crusade. Elsewhere, south of Septimania, Arian revolts were suppressed and the newly Catholic Spain limped along until its Muslim conquest in 711. Muslim conquest of Spain took place with astonishing speed, ending seven centuries of Roman domination and initiating seven centuries of Arab domination. This momentous change was the result of a single battle, the 711 Battle of Guadalete. Visigothic King Roderick is shown here pointing toward the battlefield where they all will die. Fun fact, King Roderick was a usurper. The legal heirs to his throne had asked the Muslims to come up from Af Africa and help overthrow him. File that under, be careful what you ask for. With the king and his ruling class wiped out at Guadalete, Spain offered little resist resistance to Muslim occupation. But why did it last so long, seven centuries? One reason is that Muslim rulers presided over a golden age that made Spain the cultural center of medieval Europe. Islam was started by the prophet Muhammad in 622 in Medina. Like Christianity, it was based on the Hebrew scriptures and the teachings of Abraham, Moses, Jesus, etc. But it was militantly monotheistic, denying the divinity of anyone other than the one God. It spread rapidly in parts of the Mediterranean where Aryan Christians had also rejected the Trinity doctrine. In Muslim Spain, diversity was celebrated. Libraries featured Greek philosophy and science. Muslim, ruler, Muslim rulers called Jews and Christians fellow peoples of the book. There were no first forced conversions. Christians always outnumbered Muslims, but there was no groundswell of rebellion. Jews in particular were allowed to prosper. The great mosque in Cordoba, built in 787, is now a Catholic cathedral, but it preserves some of its original Muslim architecture. Muslim armies initially conquered the entire peninsula, but in 722, a rebellion broke out in the north coastal mountains. Its leader, Pelagius, won the Battle of Covadonga and declared himself king of the new Catholic kingdom of Asturias. And thus began the 770 year long project of reclaiming Spain for Catholicism, the Reconquista. From their refuge in the Cantabarian mountains, aspiring Catholic rulers regrouped and plotted their return to power. Surely no one would imagine it would take over seven centuries. Endless warfare turned Catholic Spain into a war machine. It's all they did. Another fun fact, you may have heard the rain in Spain falls mainly in the plain, quite the opposite. The plains are semi-arid. As this rainfall map shows, the rainy areas in blue are the Northwest Coastal Mountains, home base for the reconquerors. Pelagius was the first king of Asturias, but his line died out after the 51 year reign of his great grandson, Alfonso II, king number nine, which is right there. Um, <clears throat> at which point the crown passed permanently to descendants of Peter, Duke of Cantabria, the father-in-law of Pelagius's daughter. One thing I have in common with Charles III of England and Philippe VI of Spain is that each of us is a 39th great-grandson of Peter, Duke of Cantabria. 
The main difference, of course, is that my pedigree line is less inbred than theirs. <laughs> a major development during the 51-year reign of Alfonso II was the discovery in 814 of the bones of St. James, a favored disciple of Jesus. James had been executed in Palestine seven and a half centuries earlier, but his corpse had traveled with angels, angels in a stone boat through the Strait of Gibraltar and up the Atlantic coast for burial at the northwest tip of Spain. The long buried bones were discovered by a hermit and the whole story was verified by Bishop Theodomir of Iria, who had a special talent for identifying old bones. <clears throat> Al, I think Rachel just got back from a trip over there. Alfonso was, of course, delighted at this miracle that nailed down the western tip of his tiny Catholic kingdom. He was the first person to make the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, St. James of the Graveyard. The route, took, and the route he took from his capital city of Oviedo became Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James, Europe's premier Catholic pilgrimage. <clears throat> Another event of the day was re the reemergence of the first century adoptionism heresy, which held that Jesus became the son of God at his baptism when God recognized his virtue and adopted him. For Rome, this was the worst possible heresy. It implied that Rome had crucified history's only perfect man. It was condemned and suppressed. Alfonso III, the great, king number 12, was the last king of a united Asturias. When he died in 910, the kingdom was partitioned for his three eldest sons, starting a trend that went on for centuries and posed a major obstacle to the Catholic reconquest of Muslim Spain. This is what the map looked like in, 10, in 1000, three centuries into the reconquest and for five centuries to go. The Catholics were mostly fighting each other. You might not guess from this picture that the county of Castile would end up owning everything except Portugal. In fact, it was Ferdinand the Great of the neighboring kingdom of Leon who first reunited Catholic Spain only to divide it again for his three sons. When Ferdinand died in 1065, the youngest son Garcia received Galicia, the middle son Alfonso received Leon, and Castile went to Sancho, the eldest son. This set up a drama, dr drama which has fascinated Spaniards for a thousand years. The star of the show was a soldier known as El Cid. Uh, El, El, my context, yeah. El Cid, uh, it was uh, Rodrigo Diaz El Cid who's my 27th great grandfather, was raised in the, in the palace of Ferdinand the Great and attached himself to Prince Sancho. He became Sancho's chief knight and led Sancho's successful campaign to defeat his brothers and drive them into exile. But Sancho was then assassinated, allowing the middle brother, Alfonso, to return from exile and become king of the once again United Kingdom. Legend has it that El Cid on the left forced the new king, Alfonso, to swear on a Bible that he had no responsibility for the assassination of his brother, Sancho. Never happened. No mere knight could have done that to a king. What did happen is that El Cid was sent into exile. In exile, he found employment as a leader of the Muslim armies, <clears throat> did well enough to acquire his Arabic nickname, El Cid, the Lord. Alfonso decided to rescind his exile and invite El Cid back to the Catholic side by author, offering him the Mediterranean coastal province of Valencia if he could conquer it, which he did in 1094. After his death, Valencia went back to the Muslims for a while, but El Cid was immortalized in epic poem, statue, a 1960 and a 1961 Hollywood movie starring Charlton Heston and Sophia Loren. Meanwhile, Alfonso now ruled enough, ruled enough territory to enter the gene pool of European royalty. He married Constance of Burgundy, the granddaughter of French King Robert II, starting a trend. At the bottom of this chart is Eleanor of Castile, 
Queen of England as wife of King Edward, whom she accompanied on the Ninth Crusade. These seven generations cover the entire span of the 12th and 13th century genera uh, crusades, but the Reconquista still had two more centuries to run. Did I mention that the Reconquista was the longest war in history? An important development during this period was the Albigensian Crusade, which we discussed in part two of this series. The Albigensian Crusade, Europe's first genocide is named for the city of Albi in Toulouse. The victims were Cathars, Christian heretics in the south of France. They were peaceful, ascetic, vegetarian spiritualists who roots, whose roots went back to the Aryan tradition and of course the teachings of Jesus. Pope Innocent III claimed he intended the Cathars to be converted, not killed, but when his preacher missionaries were rejected, he recruited knights. When they asked how to tell Cathars from Catholics, the knights were told to kill everybody. The Spanish connection here is Saint Dominic, a Castilian priest who joined the Albigensian Crusade as a missionary and founded the Dominican Order. He's shown here preaching to the Cathars, accompanied by Simon de Montfort, on, de Montfort on the left, the butcher of Toulouse. Um, 20, uh, my screen is covered up here. Um, sorry. 20 years of military cam campaigns secured Toulouse for the crown, but it took a century long Dominican inquisition to get rid of the Cathars. Saint Dominic is shown here presiding over the torture and execution of Cathars. Actually, the formal inquisition started after he died. This painting was made three centuries later during the 16th century Spanish inquisition, whose Dominican leaders wanted Saint Dominic to be seen as their role model. Dominicans are called the dogs of God. Um, Catholic Spain was more than half the peninsula by 1200, with Castile starting to dominate. Alfonso VIII of Castile fought two important battles on the southern border, Alacros in 1195, which he won, and a rematch at Las Novas de Tolosa in 1212, which he won. That 1212 battle was an important victory for the Catholics, but the last battle would be 280 years later. Alfonso VIII, my 23rd great grandfather, is the last Spanish monarch in my direct line, red boxes, which then passes through France to become a line of English commoners. After Alfonso VIII, the players in the Spanish drama are my cousins rather than ancestors. One of my English cousins was John of Gaunt, the man who would be king but never quite made it. He's responsible for Portu Portugal being a sovereign nation separate from Spain. A younger son of Edward III, John was Duke of Lancaster by marriage to Blanche of Lancaster who gave him seven children before dying at age 26. His older brother, Edward the Black Prince, who blocked his path to the English throne, arranged a new marriage for him. As usual, the Catholic Spanish, Spanish Catholics had been fighting amongst themselves. The Black Prince had intervened on behalf of Peter the Cruel, King of Castile, in Peter's fight against his half-brother, Henry. The Black Prince's army won the Battle of Nayera in 1367, saving Peter's throne for a while. As payment for services rendered, the Black Prince returned to England with two of Peter's daughters, princess brides for his brothers, and a big red gem known today as the Black Prince's ruby. Peter the Cruel had stolen it from Abu Sa'id, the Arab Muslim Prince of Granada, after inviting him over for dinner and murdering him. Today, six and a half centuries later, it's the most prominent feature on the British imperial crown. See if you can spot it during the, the, the coming uh, coronation. When John of Gaunt married Constance of Castile in 1371, John declared himself, declared himself king of Castile by marriage. 
But by then, Peter's half-brother Henry had murdered Peter the Cruel and assumed his crown. John would need to invade and conquer if he wanted to rule Castile. When he started his invasion 15 years later, his opponent was Henry's, <coughs> um, was Henry's son, John I of Castile, his wife's cousin. John of Gaunt arrived in Galicia with his wife and army and accepted the surrender of Santiago de Compostela, where St. James Bones had been found five centuries earlier. But King John refused to engage in battle and John of Gaunt's army ran out of food and wanted to go home. So John arranged a marriage between King John's son, Henry, and his daughter, Catherine, two second cousins who would later become king and queen of Castile, making John of Gaunt an ancestor of all future Spanish monarchs. Gaunt had also made an alliance with Portugal called the Treaty of Windsor, which sealed the deal and sealed the deal with the marriage of another of his daughters, Philippa, to King John of Portugal. That treaty lasted forever, making John Portugal independent to this day. So now you know. It also made John of Gaunt ancestor of all future kings of Portugal. By the way, the third son of that marriage was Prince Henry the Navigator, who started the Age of Exploration by sponsoring expeditions along the west coast of Africa in search of a sea route to the Indies. Indies. Which brings us to Christopher Columbus, an Italian sailor who in 1479 at age 28 became minor Portuguese nobility by marriage. That's right, Portuguese, not Spanish. His new home was a 16 square mile Portuguese island 400 miles west of Morocco, accessible only by sailing ship. Of necessity, he was well acquainted with the Atlantic Ocean. Also, Prince Henry's expeditions had started from Portuguese islands west of Africa. Columbus was part of that effort, sailing as far south as present-day Ghana before he got the idea to sail west instead of south. All sailors knew the earth was round. This idea was not original with Columbus. In 1474, another Italian, Paolo Toscanelli left, had sent this map to King Alfonso V of Portugal, showing Japan to be where we know Mexico to be. Alfonso's cartographers co correctly advised that Asia is actually three times farther west, too far to reach by sailing ship. How could Toscanelli and Columbus have been so wrong? The answer is the problem of latitude, longitude. Latitude, your north-south position is easy. If the North Star is 45 degrees above the horizon, you are somewhere on the 45th par parallel of latitude. To know your longitude, your east-west position, requires an accurate clock, which was two and a half centuries into the future. The guesswork involved in longitude gave latitude for wishful thinking. In 1483, nine years after Toscanelli's proposal to Alfonso, Columbus presented the same proposal to his son, John II, who liked the idea, but not Columbus's price. King John secretly hired his own explorers who freaked out in a storm and turned back. When Columbus realized he'd been double-crossed, he took his pitch, pitch to John's second cousin, Isabella of Castile. She was receptive, but her husband, Ferdinand of Aragon, had a different agenda, finishing the Reconquista. Columbus had to wait till the last battle of history's longest war. By Columbus's time, Catholic Spain had two king, was two kingdoms, Castile under Isabella and Aragon under Ferdinand. Their marriage united the two kingdoms with Isabella the senior partner, but Ferdinand was the warrior. Isabella paid for the army that Ferdinand led, led against Granada, the last remaining toehold of Muslim Spain. Columbus was on salary to keep him from bolting to yet another country. The final surrender came on January 2, 1492, the year that changed the world. Isabella showed up for the surren surrender ceremony riding a white horse, at least in this painting. When it came time to give Columbus, then it came time to give Columbus his final answer. The answer on January 12 was no. Columbus headed north to seek an audience with Henry VII of England. <clears throat> Uh, enter the, shoot, I can't read that. Enter the, uh, Louis de Santa Tugel to save the day. He, 
uh, con he convinced Inv Isabella to change her mind and then chased after Columbus, who was 16 miles down the road. As the court finance minister from a wealthy Jewish family, he raised the necessary money partly from his own coffers. Isabella was so grateful for his intervention that she promised him and his family exemption from the horrors of the Spanish Inquisition, which was now 14 years underway. Only one of his relatives was burned at the stake. In ships purchased by Santangel and with the blessing of the queen, Columbus crossed the Atlantic Ocean in just over two months. He made four round trips in 12 years. If he had realized that he never reached Asia, two of the world's seven continents would bear his name. Back in Spain, the question was how to celebrate victory in history's longest war. Since the Casas Belli had been a doctrinal dispute over worship of the Jewish God of Abraham, it was time to implement Spain's final solution to its Jewish problem, expel the Jews. Really? What is this thing between Christians and Jews? I have three ideas. First, Rome was always at war with Judaism. Rome felt so threatened by Jerusalem that in the year 70, it gave the holy city its Carthage treatment, total destruction. That Roman victory is celebrated by this illustration displayed today inside the Arch of Titus in Rome. <coughs> Second, there's a certain intuitive logic to monotheism based on the observation that laws of nature are the same regardless of time and place. When Europe abandoned the many gods of paganism, the logical place to turn was the Jewish God. Antisemitism is based in part on religious sibling rivalry. There's nothing intuitive about the Trinity, a patriarch, a rabbi, and a ghost merged into a three-person God. I assume Jews were gratified to see Europe adopt their religion but it's not surprising they decided to keep their own strictly monotheistic version, a choice that drove Christians crazy. And finally, there was literacy. Jewish scholars were encouraged to raise families, but the medieval Catholic world, <clears throat> reading and writing was the activity of celibate priests, monks, and nuns who were obliged, obliged to leave the gene pool. It was virtually impossible for a Catholic child to grow up in a literate household. After a thousand years of this bizarre eugenics experiment, Jews had a distinct advantage over Catholics in commerce, law, and finance, especially in Spain, where Jewish culture had flourished under Muslim rule. Their highly visible success was cause for further resentment and also a temptation for the theft of their poorly guarded wealth. Whenever Catholics conquered a new part of Spain, the Jews were ordered to convert or leave except for Jews whose expertise was needed by the royal courts. With the fall of Grenada in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella outlawed Judaism altogether, the Alhambra degree, decree. Spain thus committed cultural suicide by terrorizing or expelling its most productive citizens. Back in 1479, five years after their coronation as the Catholic monarchs of Castile, Ferdinand and Isabella had started the Spanish Inquisition at the insistence of Tomas de Torquemada, a Dominican priest of Jewish ancestry. He warned that coerced converts, conversos, were secretly practicing Judaism. Torture would reveal the truth. The Inquisition lasted three and a half centuries until 1834, capping history's longest war with history's longest reign of terror. <clears throat> Torture was used by the Inquisition not as punishment, but to obtain confessions and more accusations. The preferred methods caused internal and joint injury without leaving marks. The torture took place in private, but the trials and executions were extravagant public events called autos de fe, acts of faith. Execution was usually by burning. Remember the crime here was having an incorrect opinion about the Trinity doctrine. <clears throat> There was also blood libel, the widespread belief that Jews and conversos would use the blood of Christian boys as an ingredient in Passover matzah. In 1481, the Inqu Inquisition executed by burning eight perpetrators of this crime, the only evidence of which was their own confessions obtained under torture. As Spain was sinking into its hellscape of Catholic orthodoxy and exporting it to America, 
the rest of Europe was exploring new options, the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation was not all good. When the Spanish doctor Michael Servetus espoused the Arian heresy, he fled Spain only to be burned at the stake by the Swiss Protestant John Calvin. And Martin Luther's condemnation of Jews played a part in the Nazi Holocaust four centuries later. Henry VIII was an opportunistic Protestant. His only goal was divorce from his first wife, who happened to be a daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. <clears throat> Henry's only child by that marriage, Mary, became queen in 1533. She tried to restore Catholicism to England, executing 280 Protestants by public burning and earning herself the nickname Bloody Mary. A year into her five-year reign, she married her cousin, Prince Philip of Spain, making him King of England by marriage. He became King of Spain in 1556. This union of England and Spain by marriage fell apart two years later when Mary died in 1558 with no heir and the English crown passed to her Protestant sister, Elizabeth. Philip tried to renew it by proposing marriage to Elizabeth, but she would have none of it. Philip dealt with that rejection by launching the Spanish Armada in 1588, 30 years later, 137 ships and 55,000 men. His goal was to become King of England by conquest. In a sense, the Spanish Armada was the last true battle of the Reconquista, the use of Spanish military force to restore Catholic rule to a place where it once had been. But the defeat of Spain's Armada in the English Channel marked the end of <clears throat> marked the end of Philip's ambition and the birth of the global British Empire. For Spain, the trip home was worse than the battles. The defeated ships had to go around Britain. Two problems. On the French coast, they had cut their anchor lines to take advantage of suddenly favorable wind, sailing north with no anchors. North of Scotland, they thought they were far enough west to start south, but they were wrong. Foiled by the same longitude problem, <clears throat> that led Columbus to think he had sailed to India. When a storm drove them onto the rocky coast, west coast of Ireland, they could not anchor and wait out the storm. 1,300 Spanish sailors died here at Lakata Point, which is not a good place to be in a storm with onshore winds when you have no anchor. The rest of the Yamada <clears throat> had a similar fate, and that's why we speak English in North America and our constitution says religion is a personal matter, no concern of the state. And <laughs> 18 centuries and 40 minutes. <laughs>